Hello, hello. Hey. Hey. <laughs> Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Um, so for those of you who don't know, Adam Levy actually hosts a podcast called The Web3 Creator. Well, I think the subtitle, this the subtitle of your podcast, Mint, is the Web3 Creator Economy. It's called Mint. And then I add this like additional long thing where it's like where crypto meets creators. Amazing. Yeah. So when I was putting this event together, I discovered the Mint podcast and realized that for the last year and a half, maybe longer, Adam's interviewed literally everyone who is um, directly or indirectly related to the Web3 creator economy. So I thought this would be a great chance for us to hear from you what, you're, what you've learned um, over the last um, you know, year you've been doing the podcast. So Adam, and I also want, want you to tell the audience about what, what you're doing um, with Bello as well, but maybe to start, why did you create the Mint podcast? Yeah, so my name is Adam. I host the Mint podcast, and uh, what's up? I get to be on Rekka's live streams or her content page. I'm honored. Um, so we're almost at 400 episodes of the Mint podcast, which is kind of wild, over a year and a half. And um, I created the Mint podcast because when I was working at a fund at the time, I felt like there wasn't enough content on the creator economy and nobody would talk to me about it unless I told them I would have a, I have a podcast for them to be on. So it just so happened that I like hit record and selfishly try to learn this stuff myself. But then it kind of evolved to something much bigger than that. And uh, we publish multiple times a day, three newsletters, an episode every single day, whether long form or short form. I just did the math this week or last week. We published about like 60 pieces of content a week on the Web3 creator economy. So it started because I'm a creator myself. I've been a drummer since five years old, and I got into crypto by seeing how music was helping or how crypto was helping musicians. And then I ended up going through like the fund route, and I kind of got like bored of that, and I wanted to do something else. So I was like, all right, let's start a podcast. So I quit the fund to start a podcast. I don't know who does that, but that's what I did. Yeah. <laughs> and what is the Web3 creator economy? Oof, that's a good question. I think. Um, the way I understand the Web3 or crypto-enabled creator economy, it's creative entrepreneurs using crypto primitives to build, monetize, and own their audience. So right now, a bunch of us, we are Web2 native creators. We are on this thing called crypto Twitter. But um, there's a new paradigm evolving where we get to own our audience. We get to own the platforms that we publish our content on. And through that, we can discover new means of monetization in ways that we couldn't have done before. And crypto is like the primitive, the foundation to enable that new era. So a Web3 native creator economy is like a crypto native creator economy where creators use crypto tools, minting tokens, forming DAOs, on-chain activities to kind of build an audience, monetize an audience, and move accordingly. And what makes that different than the old creator economy or the Web2 creator economy? The biggest thing that makes it different is when we build an audience today, um, we are kind of like slaves to that audience. So when I build a following on Twitter, for example, right, that audience is native to Twitter. I can't take that to TikTok. I can't take that to Instagram. And uh, then I become a, f a slave to sort of like this algorithm. So a crypto-enabled creator economy, from my perspective, is using crypto primitives and building an interoperable audience. So an audience that you can take with you from platform so that you're not bound to the rules and barriers of the platform that you're originally building uh, an audience on, but you can use NFTs, other means of tokens to kind of like take your audience with you wherever you want. So you actually become the platform, right? So wherever you go, your audience follows. And now all the platforms want you because with a simple message, you can take your community of collectors wherever you want. So I can take them across Lens. I can take them across Zora. I can take them to Sound. I can take them anywhere I want in ways that I never was able to prior. That's like the zero to one sort of like how I understand it. Beautiful. Thank you. So you've, you've interviewed a lot of people. You've literally asked all of the questions about the Web3 creator economy. Um, what projects do you think are having the biggest impact on the Web3 creator economy today? So a few months ago, I published this blog post on Mirror called the Web3 Creator Stack. And I started the blog post kind of like shilling the, the tools that I use. And then at the end, selfishly, was a plug for Bello and how I use data sort of to kind of navigate my collector base. So my tool stack that I use as a creator and I see other creators use is guild.xyz as a way to build a community, Lens Protocol as a, will, as a way to build like a follower base, like an interoperable follower base. Um, I use sound to collect NFTs and to support creators, um, Telegram, Mirror, there's a bunch of tools. I think it really comes down to kind of 
using tools that understand that you are the creator, you are the platform, and that they build tools to kind of empower your collector base, right? So there's a, there's a variety of tools. I can I could list a laundry list if you'd like, but I plugged a few here and there. Yeah. <laughs> We're at ETH Denver. Um, is the creator economy an ETH thing, or is it cross-chain? What are you seeing outside the Ethereum ecosystem, or do we have a stranglehold on it? Creator economy is definitely multi-chain. Um, two biggest networks are ETH and Polygon. Um, biggest platforms on ETH, it's like kind of hard to tell, but Polygon, you have Lens Protocol, right? Everybody can build an audience, an interoperable audience on Polygon. Um, those are the two main platforms that I use personally, where every single season on the podcast, I give out like free NFTs to my listeners. And these are non-transferable, they have no speculative value, and I always mint them on Ethereum and Polygon. So I'd say those are the two primary chains. Yeah. Cool. And who are the first moving Web3 native creators that you think are having a big mark today? So how many of you guys were here for the Nifty Gateway era? That's what I like to call it, okay? Um, if you guys remember, there was a bunch of artists that kind of left their corporate jobs, and they're, they, they, were, they had great platforms on Instagram, and then they found NFTs as a way to, as a tool, sort of find like their creative liberation, their creative freedom. There's a few that come to mind, like Fuck Render, Fawocious, Slime Sunday, Justin Blau. Like these are some of like the premier creators that sort of set the tone for the Web3 creator economy, but now it's evolved. And if, if you guys recall from the Nifty Gateway era, era, it was mainly just like digital art. But now we have podcast NFTs, we have music NFTs, we have video NFTs. And there are all these like sub pocket of communities that all these like premier creators are, 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 are kind of like kind of arising from. So for music NFTs, I'd have to say Daniel Allen, Rio Cragen, shout out to them. Um, they're killing the game when it comes to music NFTs. Uh, video NFTs, I think there's a bunch. I think when you look at video NFTs, like the first platform that comes to mind is Glass. And I know LivePeer is like the foundation of Glass. So there's all sorts of artists kind of like minting and, and kind of like being experimentative on the video front. Podcast NFTs, I have to shout out the Mint Podcast. We're dropping podcast NFTs every, almost every week and trying to kind of experiment what that kind of looks like. Um, Photography, I'm not too well adapted with the photography uh, space, but I collect a lot of music NFTs, podcast NFTs, occasionally digital art. I think there's art. some photographers yeah. on the lens yeah. ecosystem. Are there any photographers in here? Come on, guys, who's taking pictures? There we go, what's <laughs> up? <laughs> um, how are Web2 companies and brands entering the Web3 creator economy space, and if so, how are they trying to muscle their way in? So, if you guys remember, like at the height of the bull market, you saw like all these like Pepsi brands and all these like big mainstream corporate brands. They're they they were tweeting like uh, Wag Me, and they were they were tweeting uh, uh, GMI, and that was like the top signal, 100%. Um, but now we're seeing in the bear market really cool brands and different forms of IP in Web 2 and to Web 3. The first one that comes to mind that did a really good job, in my opinion, is Smurfs. Do you guys know Smurfs? You guys heard of Smurfs? Do I show hands? Is this room awake or what? <laughs> okay. All right. So Smurfs did a really cool entrance on, on Lens. And it was a very sort of like low barrier to entry, non-threatening way to kind of enter the ecosystem. And they took their existing IP, tokenized different element, elements of it. I think in the, in the height of like the movie, if I'm not mistaken, that was coming out. There was some sort of creative event. And they kind of brought in their old collector base or their old audience and merged it with the new audience on chain. So I thought that was pretty creative. Um, you recently tweeted that every creator is going to be crypto native in the next few years. How do we get to that? I wish I knew. <laughs> no. Um, I think uh, everyone likes to say it's like education. You know, like people need to get educated on what a MetaMask is because that ends up being your entry into all these, all these primitives that we, we use on a daily basis or on a weekly basis. Um, I think the way more creators get into Web3 is that they see more use cases and case studies of crypto native creators finding success in Web3. So I think the best example that we saw recently is the height of the music creator. And, and this is thanks to platforms like sound.xyz, and Mint Songs, which shut down recently, but there were key players in this movement that tried to sell out drops or tokenize music and have creators find new means of monetization through that. 
Um, so I think using those people as examples and kind of obscuring away all the, all the buzzwords and all the lingo will end up influencing a lot more people. And forget what I think, like that's what happened, right? You saw someone like Daniel Allen raise 140K in like 48 hours with 200 Twitter followers using a mirror crowdfund. That's gonna wake up people, you know? And he's independent, he started making music in COVID, was a nobody prior to that, and then overnight, overnight became somebody. He took six months and like seven months to actually get himself ingrained, but that sparked a lot of light bulbs for a lot of other independent music artists and then motivated them to come into the space. So I think education first and foremost, but you have to be driven by use cases, show other creators outside of Web3 the monetization opportunities and do it in a way where you can show like ethical, like commemorative, you know, ways on how to monetize and build an audience. Because the industry is filled with scams. And unfortunately, like that's, that's what end up going trending on TikTok, you know, like people like clicking on that, people like viewing on that. But there's a bunch of other use cases that we need to, we need to sort of like double down on, I feel like that sort of set the example for everyone else. Yeah, I feel like that time to meaningful profitability is really huge. Like even six yeah. to seven months is, is a lot shorter than two to five years, which right. it can take on YouTube. Cool. Um, last question. What are the biggest opportunities for builders in this space? So a lot of people here are actually hacking at ETH Denver or looking to start their next project. What should they build to help grow the Web3 creator economy? So I'll give an example of something that I tried to build that didn't work out. I think, Ellie, where was it? The last hackathon, Columbia? Yes, didn't work out, but I still want to see somebody build it. And then I'll give sort of like a general, sort of like a kind of tidbit in the air. So if you're hacking this ETH Denver, try to build a Web3 native podcast player. And through that, it would be really cool if I can direct my listeners to listen to my content through that. And then they would get an NFT based off when they stopped listening so that I can understand my drop off rates and understand who my listeners are on chain. Because I built an audience on Spotify and Apple Music and on Lens and tokenizing audio uh, across the Web3 ecosystem and Web2 ecosystem, but I still don't have like listenership based data. So that's one example. I think that'd be super cool. And then I, I have different ideas as to how you could do it. And then I think if you want to build for creators at ETH Denver, try to become a creator for a few hours. And whether it's going to be like a, become a video creator or a podcast creator or a photographer, like try to be the creator and see what it's like, sort of like publishing content and then try to find pinpoints of, of, of pains, you know, pain points through that. Um, yeah, there's cool. a bunch of ideas if you if you want to come chat afterwards. And yeah. you're building. I think your co-founder is also here in the audience, and you guys just got into A16Z Crypto Startup School. Yes. Congratulations. Thank you. Just quickly tell us what you're building with that. Yeah, oh, he's shout excited. Out to the dog. Let's go. <laughs> um, all right, so Ellie and I were building Bello. Bello is a no code tool to help creators understand who their collectors are. So I alluded to earlier that I give out a ton of free NFTs to my listeners. I feel like I've minted over 20,000 across uh, six seasons to date. And um, for the longest time, I knew nothing about who my collectors were. Couldn't go to Nansen and look at the trading data. And I couldn't go to Dune because I don't know how to write code. So we sort of build this tool as a way to help creators understand what their data means and find interesting trends and insights through their collector base. So what can we surface? We can help you figure out a price, at which price point to sell your NFTs at. We can help you determine what day and time to sell your NFTs at. We can show you what assets in common your collectors hold so that you can find communities to cross promote with and so many other insights that you can use. And part of our thesis at Bello is we believe that your community of collectors will surpass your community of followers. And with that requires a new set of tools. One of them is being Bello. So Bello is the way. So if you're a creator, you have collectors, you're dropping NFTs, come talk to Ellie and I. We'll help you understand more about who they are so that you can succeed on your crypto journey. Yeah, Adam, you thank you so much. Give him a follow. Levy.eth. Sign up for his mint podcast everyone. NFT. Thank you so much. Thank you.